It's a battle between two birds of a different feather. Gamecocks versus Hawkeyes. For it all in the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament. Will the Gamecocks get revenge? Or will Caitlin Clark join the all-time greats? We'll talk about all that on today's Locked On Gamecocks and Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. You are Locked On Gamecocks. Your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation and Hawkeye Nation. Welcome to this special Final Four crossover edition between the Locked On Gamecocks and Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. I am Locked On Gamecocks host, Andrew Lyon. Please be joined by Trent Condon over on Locked On Iowa or Locked On Hawkeyes, excuse me. Locked On <laughs> Iowa is his Twitter handle. So if you want to check out more on the Hawkeyes, you can go follow him over on X in that regard. But Trent, we got the rematch that we were all probably anticipating once this tournament began. South Carolina, 37-0, and looking to become just the fifth program in women's college basketball history to finish the regular season undefeated. But Caitlin Clark and the Hawkeyes may have something to say about that. It's Caitlin Clark's last game, Kate Martin's last game, a bevy of seniors on that Iowa squad. It feels like from a storyline standpoint, Trent, we got everything we could want and more in this national title bout. Do you feel the same way? Oh, there's no doubt about it. And you know, when the brackets came out a couple of weeks ago and we saw the draw that Iowa was going to get, the potential of seeing LSU again in the Elite Eight, a Sweet 16 matchup is either going to be likely Colorado, who they played in the Sweet 16 last year, or Kansas State, who they'd already played twice this year, including one of their four losses, came at the hands of K-State. That was going to be there. Potentially UConn or USC in the Final Four in the first game. And then, of course, on the other side, there is South Carolina, and it's played out in the path. Colorado, LSU, UConn, and now here's South Carolina. I don't know if you could drop a more difficult path that I was had to face to get to this point with the storylines and all kind of the extras that have been there. Uh, the NCAA definitely got what they wanted. ESPN got what they wanted, and now we get to play for a national championship. Iowa going for their first ever in women's basketball. Yeah, absolutely. On South Carolina's side, Dawn Staley, you know, she's talked about how, how – this past season, when they lost to Iowa in the Final Four, it hurt her tremendously because of what last year's team meant to the Gamecocks, all the seniors that they had on last year's squad. And Raven Johnson, you know, was a part of that viral clip where she was waved off by Caitlin Clark to basically being dared to shoot three-pointers last year and said that it actually made her question if she wanted to continue playing basketball. Now she's come back. She's a much better three-point shooter. She's, I would say, probably the glue to this team and has helped lead South Carolina all the way back to the national championship game. So, obviously, storylines, you have everything you want, but you've also got everything you want in terms of star power. You look at Iowa's Caitlin Clark. Obviously, Caitlin Clark, one of the most prolific scorers in basketball history, period, with all the records that she has broken and all the new marks that she has also set in the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament. Then for South Carolina, it's Camilla, it's Camilla Cardoso, their star center, projected to be the number four pick in the WNBA draft. Clark's projected to be number one overall, obviously. Cardoso, six foot seven, can run the floor, high motor, and score 22 points against the NC State Wolfpack in the semifinals. So, Trent, that leads me to my next question for you. How does Caitlin Clark open things up for her team? We all know, again, how great she is scoring the basketball, but how does she kind of help everybody else in that regard? The logo threes, the deep threes, that's what gets all the headlines. You just see all the headline, uh, all the highlights of that. And that's where I think a lot of people think that when they think of Caitlin Clark, what they think about, it's not for me. When I think of her, it's the great passing. I have never seen an athlete. We've seen players that are be able to hit deep shots and hit deep three-pointers. And, and she has that, and she has more range than most women's basketball players. But it's the passing, and not just being a great passer, but the way that she makes some of the most difficult passes, the throw-ahead passes. Uh, there was a stat back a couple of rounds ago in the tournament that she has 50 assists this year from beyond half court. Throw-ahead passes, 50 of them this season wow. from the other side of the half court. That shows you how she is. She just sees the game at a completely different dimension. You know, I, I remember back to a year ago and being down in Dallas for that Final Four game. Had a uh, group of ladies in front of us, all South Carolina fans, and uh, they were having some fun and chirping a little bit before the game. And my daughter and I uh, just smiled and sat back. And very quickly, uh, they looked back and says, oh, 
you guys weren't lying. This girl can play. And, and yes, she can play. And that was an eye-opening experience, I know, for a lot of people a year ago. Uh, we're going to get into this a little bit more and kind of game plan scheme-wise. And, of course, the scheme a year ago I think is going to look a whole lot different, has to look different in this one. But when you talk about Caitlin Clark, yeah, obviously you have to talk about the shot-making, but it goes hand-in-hand -hand with the playmaking ability that she has. Three straight seasons now leading the country in scoring and assists. Uh, not an easy thing to do. You talked about your stud player in Cordosa. And I remember her a year ago with 14 and 14 uh, in that game. She played 32 minutes in the matchup against Iowa a year ago. South Carolina dominated the boards 49 to 25 in the rebounds there. So from where she was a year ago, coming off the bench for that loaded South Carolina team, what have we seen improvements, Andrew? What have you seen from her where she's even better than she was a season ago? Trent, I think that the improvement for Camilla Cardoso has mainly come uh, from a confidence standpoint. You know, you, you mentioned how she's been coming off the bench. And I mean, what better way to sort of get integrated into a starting role for a team like South Carolina, a program like South Carolina, than to play behind arguably one of the best women's college basketball players we've seen in the last decade in Aaliyah Boston. I mean, multi-time All-American, number one overall pick in the WNBA draft this past year. Camilla Cardoso was her backup. And Cardoso would have started for probably almost every other team in America if she was on their roster. So, Trent, I think that for Cardoso, it was mainly just, okay, it's now your show in the front court. How are you going to handle that added burden? And Camilla has transitioned into that role flawlessly. And the thing that makes South Carolina different this year I know that when people think about South Carolina offensively, they think about half-court basketball, swing the ball around, try to find openings on the low block, get the ball to their front court players, their post players, and basically just let them go to work. And if you miss the first shot, fine. You'll get maybe a first, sometimes third or fourth shot. Mm -hmm. But with this year's South Carolina team, the thing that makes them a lot more dangerous, I think, is the fact that they can legitimately shoot the ball from outside now. They no longer have just only one or two players that can shoot from deep. They got Tahina Pow Pow from Oregon this past offseason, probably the best addition that they've made in several years because of what she's added to this team. Bree Hall's a much better three-point shooter. Raven Johnson's a much better three-point shooter. And they got a couple of good freshmen, too, in the backcourt in Malaysia Fulwiley and Tessa Johnson. And so for Cardoso – as great as she is scoring the basketball and sometimes getting her own rebounds, she also is a really good passer. She leaves nothing to be desired in terms of power on her passes. Uh, you know, it really opens things up for the Gamecocks in terms of being able to play inside and out. And so you can't just crash on South Carolina's post players like you maybe could have in years past, like maybe Iowa did a little bit last year. If you do it again, it's a little bit more of a gamble than maybe it would have been over the past couple of seasons. So we talked about Caitlin Clark and Camilla Cardoso now, Trent, for a little bit. So let's talk about now how can you limit? Is there a way to limit the prolific scoring ability that Caitlin Clark has and just how dominant and physical Camilla Cardoso can be for South Carolina on the low block? What are, what are your thoughts on Caitlin Clark in that regard? Well, with Caitlin Clark, we've seen it. We've seen a bunch of different teams do things, and including what we saw from Ewell defensively in the game last night from UConn. It's very difficult to do that. There are very few defenders that can play at that level, that sustain energy that it takes to face Carter up and down the floor, do those kind of things, and also have the length on top of it to slow down the backdoor cuts and do those kind of things. Because Caitlin Clark, you watch her play. And there's certain games where you can see early on. Maybe the shot's not falling. There, there's times, but she figures it out very quickly. Her basketball IQ is as high as anybody that I've ever seen in the women's basketball game. It is, it is unlike anything other. And she'll plod, she'll wait, she'll kind of figure things out. And usually by about the middle of the second quarter, even if teams kind of have a really good defensive game plan, she hasn't figured out. It took two and a half quarters before she figured it out against UConn and finally started to open things up Hit a couple of three-pointers in that one. You could see her ability and knowing what she had to do off the ball to get it back and put herself in scoring position. So that's one thing. I don't think there's just many defenders like Mule, like UConn has, that has both the size, the speed, and the length to be able to keep up with her and do it sustained. I would anticipate because of the depth of South Carolina, they're going to throw a whole lot of people there. On the other side... What can you do? Cordoza 6-7. What, what has been a game plan? What has been anything that you can do? Get her in foul trouble? Is that it? 
Getting her in foul trouble, I would say, Trent, is definitely well way to go about it. And that has happened a couple times this year. It's been rare, but there have been moments where Cardoso has gotten two fouls, say, in the first eight, ten minutes, and Saffron has had to lean on the front court depth that they have. But I think the most important thing for Iowa coming into this game, if you're trying to stop or limit Camilla Cardoso, I should say, is you're going to have to get back in transition defense. Camilla Cardoso, again, I mentioned earlier, she's six foot seven. And when we talk about six foot seven post players in women's college basketball, you know, you don't necessarily imagine someone that can just sprint down the floor and transition and get buckets. That's not the case with Camilla Cardoso. She will run from coast to coast to the other end of the floor to get easy layups. And she's got a very, very high motor. And so for Hannah Stalky, you know, I imagine that she's going to be able to accomplish that in that regard with transition defense, but mm -hmm. she's also six foot two, six foot three. So she's going to need her teammates to run back with her because if Carolina runs down the floor and they see Cardoso post up immediately on the low block, which is what she'll do, and it's just Stalky right there and she has no help, they will throw the ball right to her and basically just say, go to work, get yourself a bucket. And so if you're Iowa, it's not just Stalky. You need to have pretty much your entire squad run down to the other end of the floor, make sure Saffron does not get easy opportunities. If you don't accomplish that, that's how it can turn to a long night for Anna Stalky and that Hawkeye front court. When we come back in a couple of moments, Trent and I are going to talk about some of the bigger concerns in this game. What does South Carolina and Iowa have to worry about? We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a few moments right here on Locked on Gamecocks and Locked on Hawkeyes. Brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team, both faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals that you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all of that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates to choose from. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours when they use LinkedIn jobs. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free today. Terms and conditions do apply. All right, three, two, and one. Welcome back to this special championship crossover edition between the Locked On Gamecocks and the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast, where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks and Iowa Hawkeyes every single day. Thank you once again to all of you every dayers who make us your first listen or watch wherever you get your audio podcast daily or on YouTube. Trent, let's talk about some concerns coming into this game. And for this first one, I mainly want to direct this to you and Iowa because for the Hawkeyes, look, played a really tough game against the UConn Huskies just last night against the UConn Huskies at the time of this recording, I should say. You know, played past 11.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, came down to the final few possessions. And Nika Buell, as you mentioned earlier, played pretty doggone good defense against Caitlin Clark and at least made her work for her points. So is there any concern on Iowa's side about maybe a little bit of fatigue settling in for this game, at least maybe in the second half? I, I think so. And it's something though, that I was already talked about. Uh, Coach Bluter mentioned this in her press conference on Saturday, that this is something that last year, I think was a learning experience for them. That quick turnaround coming from Friday night, into that Sunday afternoon a championship game, understanding how important rest is, how important it is for everybody to get off their feet, to really take this time and use as much as possible to, to get yourself right physically to come back. And because it was an emotional win, and it was an emotional win last year, and then you got to come right back and play you know, less than two days later. So because of that, I think last year's experience is going to help. The other thing, and you go back to the LSU game, you look at the UConn game, I win the second half of games, that's when they've dominated teams. That's when they've been at their best. And though they're not the deepest team, they're certainly not as deep as South Carolina. Physically, the way that they run, the way that they go, that is one of their strengths. So I would anticipate it's not going to be a factor of that they're tired. 
because that has not been a case all year long. And second halves have been good for them. It's more, I think, the mental fatigue that could be wearing in. You just look at what they've done, dealt with emotionally, beating LSU and then beating UConn and doing it in that fashion. It wouldn't be the physical part of it. It's the emotional part that I have maybe the most concern. And, of course, on the other side, the motivation. And that's where I want to go with you, Andrew, is this motivation. Because there are certain coaches that love to use motivation. I mean, you know, we see Hurley at UConn, what he's doing on the men's side, and he'll take any little slight and turn it, you know, mountain into a mole. Kim Mulkey last year, she took the game plan that Iowa used against you guys and used it as motivation for her team. One of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen, yet they, she was able to use that as motivation. How about Don Staley? The motivation losing in the Final Four to Iowa a year ago. Is that, do you believe, a card that she's going to be using with her team? A, a much different team, obviously. Yeah, Trent, I actually think that that's something that Don's not going to bring up a whole lot to her team. I think that that's something where it's almost like, it's going to be left unsaid because the players are going to know good and well, th this is personal. You know, this is for the freshies who went out, unfortunately, losing in the final four this past year for players like Aaliyah Boston, Zaya Cook, Letitia Mehir, Victoria Saxton. Again, a great group of seniors that for South Carolina fans probably felt like it was destiny that they were going to win a national championship. And that was how they were going to walk away from South Carolina's women's basketball program. And it did not happen. And when we get into maybe overall concerns for both teams coming into this game, Trent, I will admit that is sort of one concern that I do have for South Carolina. You know, it's not necessarily on court play, but it's more so, again, the mental aspect. Do they get a little bit too psyched up? This is a team that Dawn Staley has mentioned several times the past few days. They made her change as a coach this season because this is a team that, you know, they like to goof off. They they <laughs> stay very loose, sometimes maybe a bit too loose when Dawn wants him to get serious. And at first she kind of fought back against that, but then eventually she just kind of realized, you know what, I'm just not going to be able to get them to just completely change. I'm going to have to just adapt and I'm going to have to kind of nitpick my battles in terms of, you know, what I want to remain our standard and what I'm willing to kind of let slide a little bit. Does that change in this game? Because this is for the national championship. You're not yeah. playing just to make it there. You're not playing a regular season game. It's not an SEC tournament game. You've played all those games now. This game is different. And South Carolina, admittedly, in the first half against NC State, they didn't help themselves a ton in terms of ball secure. They had eight turnovers in the first half against the Wolfpack. Now, after that first half, they only had two for the rest of the game. So they seem to settle down. But does that happen again against Iowa, knowing that it's for it all, knowing the implications of this is, again, revenge opportunity against the Iowa Hawkeyes? That is something that does worry me. Another thing that worries me is on-ball screen defense. South Carolina, if there's one thing that they've kind of struggled in defensively the past couple games, mainly against Indiana and Oregon State before they made it to the Final Four, it was on ball screen action that led to three point shots for the Hoosiers and the Beavers. And that's what kept both of those teams in this ball game. And obviously, if the Hoosiers and the Beavers can pull that off, I have to imagine Iowa can do the same exact thing as well. At least the Bluter can draw up some plays that's going to get Caitlin Clark some open looks, maybe a Kate Martin or a Gabby Marshall. Because Gamecock fans, I think, learned last year, it's not just Caitlin Clark that can shoot the three ball well. Iowa's got a ton of good perimeter three point shooters. So, that's another concern on the court that I have as far as South Carolina goes. But Trent, is there anything from a concern standpoint that might maybe worry Hawkeye fans outside of, again, maybe the mental fatigue coming into mm -hmm. this national title bout? It's definitely inside. I mean, we've talked a little bit about Cardoso and just how good she is, how talented she is and, and the size. Because coming into the season, and you may remember a year ago, Addison O'Grady, she came off the bench for Monica Sonato. She was the backup big. And felt like she was going to be the heir apparent this year. She was going to take over. You know, she played a lot of minutes a year ago. Um, it was her and Sharon Goodman fighting for that starting job at the center position. And a couple of weeks into the season, Coach Bluter and company said, you know what? They're not playing at the level that we want. We're going to go small. So instead, we're going to move Hannah Stolke from the four to the five. She's going to be our center. And we're going to go four guards around it. And it's obviously worked incredibly well. Leading the country and scoring again this season. Uh, they're able to, instead of trying to put, you know, kind of a, a round peg in a, in a square hole. They're just saying, we're going to play our style. And it's worked out incredibly well for them. Now you can take Iowa out of that style. But because of that, you're playing a power forward against the center and Cordosa. You're giving up a lot of height there. And it's really the rebounding. I mean, you look at the box score from a year ago, 49-25 in rebounds. Iowa can't win the game. I don't think it that way. Can you even keep it within 10? Maybe you got a shot. Or if 12, you know, something like that. You know, if it's 45-33, 
maybe we're talking about something here, but last year, just that statistical profile was such an anomaly. And again, it's the power inside. That's a concern. Now, Grady has come in. She played really well against Angel Reese. And Angel Reese was hot at the beginning of that game. I mean, she was getting buckets. She was doing whatever she wanted. And O'Grady was able to come in and really do things, beat her down the floor a couple of times for a bucket. You know, she did those kind of things on top of it, what she did defensively. So that's going to be interesting too, but she just hasn't played a ton this year. And because of that, you know, where is she going to be? If Iowa needs her for 15, 18 minutes against Cordoza, is she going to be able to give high level minutes at, at that level? I guess that would be one of the concerns coupled with obviously a smaller player going up against her. So it's kind of the same story that we had a year ago. Plus, here's another thing for you, Andrew. Iowa can't use the same game plan that they did a season ago. It was beautifully drawn up. So uh, Coach Fitz, one of the assistant coaches who's retired, uh, they've kept her around in a, a retirement role. She was the one that had the scout for South Carolina last year. That game plan, it was beautiful. And you guys saw it play out. It was smart. It worked incredibly well. And they did what they had it to. But the South Carolina team is such a better perimeter team than they were a season ago. That same camp, game plan can't work. And you do have that concern, I think, Boy, we came up with a beautiful game. Can you really do it two years in a row against South Carolina? That's the tough part. Can I would do it for the second year in a row, or will South Carolina get the payback that they've been waiting for for a very long time? Trent and I will give our final predictions on the game in a couple moments right after these messages. Welcome back to today's crossover edition between the Locked On Gamecocks and Locked On Hawkeyes podcast, where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks and Iowa Hawkeyes every single day in just 30 minutes. All right, Trent, we've talked about the game plenty now, the star power, the storylines, the strategy. So now let's give our final thoughts and predictions. What do you think is going to happen in this matchup? Well, I told you a year ago I thought this was going to be a coronation for South Carolina, that they were going to run away and hide, and I was dead wrong. Um, I hope I'm dead wrong once again in this one. I do have South Carolina. Now, I, I have to admit to you, too, um, I'm heavily invested in your Gamecocks. So throughout the course of the season, I was almost calling it another free square. The motivation that they were going to have, uh, how well they were playing through a long course of the season. So I got a lot of parlays that are already tied up. I got a couple with the Chiefs, South Carolina women, and the UConn men. I got another one with the South Carolina men, uh, South Carolina women the Yukon men and the Boston Celtics. So I got all these parlays going around and this could be very profitable, but this is another part. <laughs> so uh, actually I'm, I'm kind of trying to think of a way financially to hedge out of it a little bit and bet some Hawkeye money line. But I just think it, it's with the motivation aspect that South Carolina is going to have being able to know what happened to them a year ago against this team. Maybe some of that mental fatigue coupled with, I think they're going to have a really good game plan to slow down Caitlin Clark, all those things together. I just think it all points up to South Carolina. I think we're going to get a good game. I think this one's going to come down to the wire. Plus, I picked against Iowa, against UConn, and against LSU. So why break a streak? Give me South Carolina. <laughs> That's fair. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, That's right? That's right. Yeah. Um, and by the way, if you're interested in creating your own parlays, you can go check out our friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Um, Trent, I, I pretty much agree with you. Um, I think that for South Carolina, look, this this is a different South Carolina team this year. This is not the South Carolina of old. A lot of people have actually asked the question, is this a better South Carolina team? Because, you know, last year, again, admittedly, this team leaned on experience, it leaned on defense, and it leaned on premier post play. But it did not have great perimeter shooting. And South Carolina managed to scrape by with that. I say scrape by in the fact they went 36-0. But then they eventually ran into one of the best shooters in modern basketball, and that was Caitlin Clark. And that was where it finally came back to bite them. So I think that this has been a long-awaited rematch for South Carolina. I do think that they're going to come out firing in this game. I do agree with you, though. I don't think that it's going to be a blowout. I do think we'll see maybe a couple, you know, basically a game of runs. South Carolina might come out on fire, but then Iowa might bounce back a little bit, and it'll turn to a chess game between Lisa Bluter and Don Staley, who writes up the better game plan the rest of the way. So I think it's going to be a close one, but I do have South Carolina winning this matchup as well. It's going to be a fun one here in Cleveland, Ohio, at the Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse Arena. Trent, 
Thank you so much for coming on for this crossover show between the Locked On Gamecocks and Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Where can Gamecock fans find all of your work on Iowa and everything else that you do? So I host a daily radio show in Des Moines from 11 to 1 Central Time on KXNO, Des Moines Sports Station. I do that. And, of course, Locked On Hawkeyes each and every day. The Twitter account's Locked On Iowa. Somebody must have stolen the other one. We're, we're at Locked On Iowa there. You can also find me individually at Trent Condon, uh, dealing with the conspiracy theories that are out there, of course, from the UConn fans. You know, we, we all cried a, a lot. I know tears for, for UConn after last night. And, boy, that fan base, uh, whew, so they did not take that one well. <laughs> I, I got I, before we go, Andrew, I got to get your perspective on this one. All right. I, I got it because okay. there's a lot of people that with a lot of thoughts. So your thoughts on the moving screen heard across the world. It was a moving screen because Edwards clearly stuck out her elbow. I did feel that that was a out, in terms of the call it was correct. I do understand why people maybe didn't like the timing of it, but it was a foul. So. <laughs> I, I do think it was the correct call. And also, you know, we always try to make games about just one play now. Mm-hmm. It's not just one play. It's a bevy. It's a sequence of events that leads to that kind of moment. So I can understand UConn fans being frustrated. You know, if you're a fan of a team that loses in that fashion, anybody would be upset. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and the stuff that I've heard about how Gabby Marshall has taken a lot of heat for it, yeah. that's ridiculous, y'all. Yeah. She's a college student. And I'm not saying that to Gamecock fans. I'm saying that for anybody. Anybody yeah. that said anything to her, that's wrong. That's crossing a line. So. She was trying to fight through a screen. Why, how is that her fault that the referee blew the whistle? And here's the other thing that's been driving me nuts is I've continued to hear from people that say, well, just let the players decide the game. Gabby Marshall was trying to decide the game. She was trying to play great defense and a moving screen knocked her out of the play. That is a player trying to decide the game. You can't illegally take her out of it. All right, that aside, Andrew, <laughs> good stuff out of you. Appreciate it. It's, it, yeah, the, these people have been driving me nuts for the last 24 hours. Hey, I, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Sport, sports brings out the best in people, but unfortunately, sometimes it brings out yeah. the worst in people as well. No question about that. He is Trent Condon of Locked on Hawkeyes. I'm Andrew Lyon of the Locked on Gamecocks podcast. Excuse me, Locked on Gamecocks podcast. You can find Locked on Gamecocks on YouTube or where you get your audio podcast daily. And you can find me at a line underscore SC on X. And by the way, line is spelled L-Y-O-N, not L-I-O-N. That's just a common misconception people have about my last name. But that aside as well, thank you all so much for tuning in. We hope that you all enjoyed the game. Have a great rest of your Sunday. We'll be sure to catch you all on our next show of Locked on Gamecocks and Locked on Hot Guys. Sweet. Trent, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on. Yes, thank you. I'll be sure to send this your way. Um, I will just go ahead and tell you it's probably going to take a little bit because I'm working on my personal hotspot because Wi-Fi and I have a horrible relationship when I go to an NCAA tournament, period. Yeah. <laughs> I went to the NCAA men's tournament in Pittsburgh a couple